Okay, I think it's one o'clock, so let's jump right in. Um, welcome, everybody. It's Tuesday. It's one o'clock. That's our clinic time. And uh, I just checked our uh, Google sheet. There weren't, weren't any questions there, but I'm going to pause anyway and ask uh, for those of you who are here today, are there any questions right now? Nothing at the moment, Gerd. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Uh, okay, last, last week's highlights. Um, uh, I'll, I'll keep moving this uh, with me uh, until registration closes for the 2022 European HDF Users Group event. Uh, website is still up and open uh, for registration. And again, it's a hybrid event. Uh, if you can make it, you can travel there and it's going to be great. Uh, it's a, it's a hotspot in Provence. And, uh, but if not, then uh, you're welcome online as well. Um, other announcements, uh, we just released uh, a release candidate for 112.2. Um, source code is available for testing. Uh, there are several new things, but uh, most importantly, uh, the uh, parallel compression improvements uh, that were first introduced in 113.1 were backported to 112.2. So you can enjoy them there as well. And then uh, John is prepare. John Reedy is preparing uh, the next release of HSDS, and uh, there are sort of two things that caught my eye. Uh, number one is he now supports fancy indexing. So if you are not familiar with NumPy arrays, um, I, I also added a link here. Uh, in NumPy arrays, you can basically provide a a list of column numbers or row numbers or something like that. And then um, when you do a selection um, on an HDF5 data set and so forth, certain columns, let's say for two dimensional data sets or rows and or rows, uh, then um, that's just fine. And H5Pi slash NumPy will just do the right thing. And uh, what's important here is also that, so not only is there support for that, but unlike H5Pi, meaning uh, using the traditional HDF5 library, um, HSDS actually, if you have, let's say, a long list of columns, um, HSDS will actually paralyze um, those reads, for example, and uh, uh, processing them in parallel. And uh, so that's a good thing. And here's just an example. I think John provides, there's also reference with which, with which data set or with which domain, as he calls it, um, tried this. So for example, let's say here in this one example, he took 4,000 random columns from a 17,520 by roughly 2 million two-dimensional data set. And, and then he was just testing, well, uh, how does that scale? if I increase the number. So I, I imagine this runs on Kubernetes and, and uh, this is sort of the number of pairs of uh, data nodes and service nodes. Um, so the scaling is not perfect, but uh, pretty good improvement. I mean, my understanding is what, 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 what's reading here as nodes, this is running on the same EC2 instance. It's just maybe he should have said here, pods rather than nodes. So that's a little confusing. I believe uh, I, I, I can, I'll, I'll ask him, get back to you next week. But I think that means is really, it's running within the same EC2 instance and you're just increasing the number of um, data node and service nodes. So it's not different physical EC2 instances. It's running on the same instance. And uh, another important <clears throat> feature, and I, I think he created this picture. Uh, previously in HSDS, there was a limitation that um, when you made a selection and it turned out uh, that selection or that read request, for example, or write request for that matter, affected more than a thousand chunks, um, the HSDS server would actually return an error. And um, he removed that limitation uh, in zero or uh, in, it will be released that uh, uh, lifting of that restriction in HSDS uh, 0 
but if you want to try it right now or this is something that affects you already uh, please go ahead and try it but but according to john um, that's that's yeah one of the major improvements in uh, 0 0.7 okay uh before we jump to the forum any any questions so far okay then let's jump right in there were uh, lots of good things happening um number one uh yeah a user noticed that um uh they they for some reason they just switched upgraded um from hdf java 2.6 um something to the latest 3.3.2, I imagine. And they, as all good software engineers and developers out there, they have a test suite. And all of a sudden they notice that by just sort of changing the library uh, uh, dependence, uh, they were seeing errors that they hadn't seen before. And in this particular case, um, my colleague Alan actually commented on that. Number one, he pointed out that um, first of all in in prior versions so probably in the 2.x series of hdf java releases um, there were um, exceptions some exceptions were just ignored silently and so the user or developer never saw them so that's one change in behavior but then in this specific instance if you go back and read this thread and look at the error trace um, well, first of all, that there is, these are all info mes messages, by the way, um, in, in terms of the log4j interface, for example. Um, but in this particular instance, it also turns out that um, if the HDF5 live, the Java uh, HDF5 library uh, sees a two dimensional data set of a scalar type, it, it for as it, trying to be helpful, uh, I would call this, trying to be helpful, the library tries to detect um, whether that two-dimensional data set maybe conforms to one of the um, uh, conventions, such as there is, for example, the HDF5 image convention, and it is part of the image convention that there are certain magic and double quotes attributes such as there would be a palette attribute there would be a class attribute and i forgot i think one other attribute and so the library is actually trying to open these attributes what i don't understand though is uh, uh, there is an h5a exists call why the library does not use the h5a exists call i think it just does an H5A get open by name, which is of course wrong. Uh, I mean, wrong, it's it's a little heavy handed is maybe the right word in the sense that before you, uh, so so rather than just trying to open it and fail, it, it would be a little more defensive to say, uh, well, let me check if that attribute exists and then go ahead. Yeah, Elena. Hmm? Uh, you know, I believe there is, a limitation of specification because the attributes names are similar to other specs and they really need to read the value what it is like class or whatever it, it was uh, not well designed spec or with limitation it was first try and it's trying mm -hmm. to uh, kind of accommodate for that because you may have files with similar attributes and it will be different, not image, but something else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm it, just jumping over here to the post. Um, so yeah, this is sort of the arrow trace. And yeah, so it, it's really at the top level here, there is an H5A open by name. And uh, I think, yeah, it, it's looking, the, the attribute name is palette. And, and I think, yeah, that's just a little heavy handed. Why not here call H5A exists? Uh, um, it may not exist when it was written. That's another. Thing. Maybe, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, it may not have existed when that high level API, so to speak, was written. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, thank you. Um, yes. And then, but then, of course, on the flip side, uh, now, at least the way Alan put it, we have expected errors or, or sort of, yeah, he, he's basically saying that, okay, 
well, just ignore it. Don't don't look there, which is a, <laughs> which is a little tongue in cheek. But then, yeah, which which error is an error, and which error is not an error. <laughs> So yeah, that's okay. Um, it can be sorted out, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 But maybe it's time also because I think yeah, the specification itself is is pretty sound. I mean, the convention is not uh, particularly complicated or anything. It's just yeah, the implementation is maybe yeah a little yeah, and and then with with the with hindsight that maybe certain calls didn't exist back when mm. um, that now yeah. These things surface. Okay. Uh, and the specification I meant it can be collision with uh, other specs, like with dimension mm -hmm. scales. So we need to check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, then there was a, a another one. Uh, it was interesting, and I was really impressed by uh, sort of the response time from our team. Uh, is a user noticed that? Uh, so I think last time we talked about. Um, getting the uh, object count and so forth. And here is sort of the Fortran version. So there is a Fortran version of this called h5f underscore get obj underscore count underscore f. And um, he, the user was noticing that, so uh, of course, yeah, he tried to determine um, the number of sort of open handles, so to speak. And he noticed that for some reason, the answers that he got depended on, my understanding is that when you use the Fortran uh, interface, you have to first initialize the library, you have to call h5open underscore f. But then it so happens because of the control flow, in his case, that h5open f was called in several places at several times. And we know that, uh, for example, with the C API, that's not a problem because um, once you call it a second time or a third time, there are really no side effects from that. But it, it's, it appeared that um, there were side effects to H5 open F. And uh, so uh, Scott actually responded and he took a look. And yes, if you look in GitHub, for example, at the source code for H5 open F, it's not just a straight call to, to H5 uh, open but there is a little more state information being initialized and so forth. But yeah, it turns out that there were uh, bugs probably as over time additional variables, so to speak, additional state variables were introduced. It was just forgotten to then on H5 close F uh, to really call them and clean them up properly. But it turns out Scott uh, just uh, created a pull request and um fixed it and um hey that's an under 24 hour turnaround which is pretty pretty impressive <laughs> um okay so so that was good and then the um the third post um was and and uh, thank you steve for for being so um uh, detailed and comprehensive in your responses it gave me sort of the material for today's tips, tricks, and insights. So a user was basically asking, he, he was saying, okay, I, 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 I just threw this structure together uh, with three um, C++ standard vectors inside, which he, which he called field A, B, and C, and he calls that thing test H5. And then he was asking about, well, how do I read this using C++ or uh, how do I write this to begin with, and so forth? And then, uh, yeah, Stephen replied, and uh, all the the sentences and so forth um, are quotations here uh, from Steve's reply. But in a way, the the sort of the message here is, I think, um, the nice thing about this is really uh, you can. This is in a way a lesson in how H five CPP when you are thinking about how to lay out your data and so forth. H5CPP really makes you in a way ask, ask the right questions before you go any further. That's how I would put it. But maybe before I go there, I'm just gonna pause. Are there any other questions? Um, no, okay, good, then let's go with it. So, um, so Stephen basically replied and said, hey, um, 
let's generalize this just a tiny bit or actually make make it correct because this is obviously not it wouldn't compile as it stands here but um, so this is basically uh, parameterized over that type um, that uh, that element type of this vector you could write this as such a template and of course the problem with this is as Steve points out that um, uh, just in terms of the memory layout, um, this uh, is not going to be uh, contiguous in memory and it would require some kind of uh, gather or scatter mechanism to uh, deal with these individual vectors. And, uh, but then of course you have options here and even, even before you talk about these options, what you, by looking at this, what you can also ask yourself, well, sort of, um, are the what what you might the user or the developer of this code might actually have information uh, about invariants that is not expressed here? Uh, so, for example, the first question you could ask: Well, do these three vectors do they tend to have the same length? And if they if they did, then of course that information, that invariant, so to speak, would be obscured here and hidden. And you could either make that an additional template parameter or something like that. And then of course you would go maybe with an array here rather than a vector. Um, but then also you will quickly ask yourself, well, which way should it be a structure, an aggregate of vectors, or should it be a vector of, uh, records of, of, of aggregates of, a, uh, of the three element types. And so, so you start thinking about that. And then moving over to HDF5, you have basically three, I would argue there's actually a fourth option, um, how you can lay this out uh, in HDF5. Uh, number one would be what I would call uh, sort of the columnar layout. And that means each of these fields uh, becomes an individual data set, an individual column, if you wish. Uh, so that group would represent, it would be like the handle or the placeholder uh, for, the, um, for, the, uh, for the aggregate. And then you would have three columns in there. And uh, this is certainly, um, it gives you fast column access. Um, it uh, is, if you want, uh, uh, if you want to go by, go by rows, this could be a little more complicated, but it's also pretty straightforward from, yeah, Julia, Python, R, C, etc. Uh, the next uh, option would be to to use your yeah, sort of a record oriented uh, layout, meaning a vector of tuples or tuples. I think tuples is the right pronunciation. Um, so where you would have, again, you would basically re-roll, unroll, and re-roll uh, this, this definition. And you would say, well, rather than making this an aggregate, a struct of vectors, I'm going to make it a vector of tuples. And um, you would work then with a single data set rather than three separate data sets here. And of course, this gives you fast indexing uh, by rows, but then your columnar access become slower. And then uh, the third option is basically, yeah, you can you can say, and um, if you say, well, in practice, I need both. I need reasonably fast row oriented access and I need reasonably fast uh, column oriented access, then you probably are looking at something middle of the road, so to speak, where you just um, identify blocks of this overall thing and then the individual blocks could then be either they could be columnar or they could be records um, depending on which way you want to go but then there is also something when i say hybrid here what i mean by that is you could also then rather than uh, sort of uh, taking all columns and doing something to all columns you could have what what is known also from some of the NoSQL databases, you could have column groups, for example. So you would have column groups and then you could have row groups. So you can take this 
a little further, and I call this the hybrid approach. But I mean, it is a form. It is it is in a way a form of blocking. It would be you could call it row blocking or column blocking. Um, but yeah, so not not anything earth shattering new. Basically, here, but, the, the, they are the same. Sorry to interrupt. So the the yeah. block and the hybrid. Mm -hmm. Be speaking of the same, probably different. Okay. Way, but that's. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and and then of course the beauty uh, of it is, or Steve. Uh, I, th I think rightly points out that out of the box H5CPP provides mechanisms for for the two first approaches, the columnar layout and the the record uh, oriented layout. And uh, so here is the the columnar layout. And again, the beauty of this is really the there's just one operator that does all the lifting. Uh, so we declare our data. The formatting is not as pretty here, but we have basically three arrays. And of course, in this case, we have, if you wish, a ragged uh, thing where you have uh, you have four elements in the first vector, you have three elements respectively in the second and third. So, but that's not a problem. You just create your HDF5 file. And then let's say we call this group that represents this collection of three columns, so to speak, as some path, and then you just, uh, for each column name, field A, field B, field C, you just fire and forget, you just uh, plunk it in there and, and that's it. It doesn't get easier than that. And then uh, on the other hand, um, if you wanna go down the, uh, the record approach, um, the uh, assumption here is, yeah, okay, uh, we would define some kind of structure or a plain old data uh, uh, my underscore t that has these three fields for argument's sake integers. And um, now uh, Steve is pointing out somewhere here that um, uh, right now uh, he does not yet support tuples, but there will be <clears throat> support for tuples in the next release of 8.5CPP. Uh, then, uh, so in the meantime, uh, you will just uh, sort of declare this. And uh, then of course, um, you would create a, a compound type, which would be sort of the HDF5 version of a record type. And um, to deal with that symbolic information, um, you have to get a compiler involved in this case. And, uh, but then uh, the, the definition of that compound type and so forth, that's all the code for that is auto-generated for you uh, by the compiler and it doesn't get much easier. And, and yeah, this is what the code looks like. And what's not shown here is the include of the generated header that you have to do, but that's really um, uh, not, not a big deal. And uh, yeah, and then the, the example uh, that he gives is, yeah, if you, if you have some kind of event recorder where you have some kind of timestamp data coming in from a socket or somewhere, uh, you can just, and, and yeah, let's assume that the, the record structure is constant, uh, uh, invariant in the sense that you, you expect the same field. Some of them might be invalid though, um, over and over again, then yeah, you can go into this kind of for loop and then keep appending, that's another 85 CPP operator uh, to that data set. And then uh, that's good. And, and that's all you need. And um, yeah, so he also points out that um, uh, you, can, you can look at this when you think about sparse uh, matrix formats, for example, that yeah, uh, you, can, you can store matrices as um, in, in row or column oriented fashion, where basically, let's say for, um, for a, a row uh, compressed storage, you would basically store three arrays. You would store one array where in row major order, you walk over the matrix and you just store the values, the non-zero values that is. Um, then uh, you would have um, an array 
that would for each of these non-zero values would store the uh, uh, the uh, the row uh, numbers, and then you would have what's called a column pointer index, where you would basically have offsets into that array where you would store the column numbers uh, for these non-zero values. So you are replacing a two-dimensional uh, sparse, uh, logically two-dimensional, but sparse, sparsely populated array by three dense arrays. And yeah, you can do that row major by traversing over the values row major, or you could do it column major, and then you end up with compressed row storage or compressed column storage. And um, yeah, that's what that is. And then, yeah, he points out that, um, uh, uh, he points out that, yeah, he has actually talked about this much more extensively um, at a, uh, uh, at a, at a, at a different event and he has some slides and examples and, uh, but then, yeah, this, this is just sort of, I think, uh, was Steve's first response in this thread, because then the, the user started shifting the goalpost. He asked about, well, what if I have a string member there? And then, okay, Steve being Steve, of course, showed him how to deal with, uh, of course, the a variable length string would create this get up, get up problem again, because then we are not talking about, then we are talking about the non-contiguous layout, but if you can handle a, uh, or solve your problem with a fixed size string, then it's contiguous. And the same automation uh, mechanisms described here apply. But then of course, H5CPP <clears throat> has a lot more optimizations, such as, for example, if you, um, have initializers uh, where the, the value doesn't exceed um, 64K or something that would be uh, suitable to use compact layout in HDF5, then H5CPP does that automatically. We talked about strings already, but then the user also says, well, what if uh, one of these fields is, a, is an array type rather than sort of a arbitrary length uh, a vector or something, but that's all covered. and. Uh, I would definitely, if that, that's a use case for you, or one of those is a use case for you, uh, go on and read, uh, go on and read that thread because yeah, examples and everything is there. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what I had on the tips and tricks. Again, uh, if, you, if, if you are interested in C++, go check out H5CPP. Um, because yeah, with respect to HDF5, it really, the, the best way I think I can put it is really, it makes you ask the right questions because if you just start with this abstract notion of, well, okay, I have something in C++, in, uh, in C++ and then, okay, here are the things that I have in, uh, uh, as primitives available in HDF5 with the type system, the layouts and whatnot, then you, you quickly, uh, especially if you maybe do this for the first time, you, you go down a rabbit hole easily where you just get distracted and just by things looking similar, you might think, well, if it looks similar, why not do it? And there's nothing wrong, why not do it, try it. But then uh, once you, rather than having a Mickey Mouse size problem, you, you do this with, large data sets and so forth, you will see that uh, these initial choices, sort of the first idea uh, were a little misguided. And then you have to understand, well, why is that? Why am I not getting performance? And that, that's all. If you have the time to explore all that, that's great. But most people don't have time. And uh, the, the good news is other, other people have made the mistakes for you <laughs> already and uh, come up with solutions. And uh, so, yeah, why not take something that is tried and true and just use it and enjoy it and then focus on solving your problem uh, rather than uh, inventing the wheel. Okay. Any other comments, questions? No? Okay. The, this might be the first time that we are closing a few seconds early, um, but uh, thanks for coming and yeah, we'll, We'll be next 
back next week. I have some ideas. One of the ideas I had for tips and tricks, unless some, something else comes up on the forum, is to maybe come back to strings, sort of talk about that. That seems to be a recurring uh, issue uh, the, the different encodings and then okay there's the fortran style strings and c style strings and then there's this null terminator thing and when do i need it and, and it, it gets pretty obscure and complex quickly so my plan was to just prepare i, I i'm going to call it all about strings <laughs> or no strings attached <laughs> and uh but but then basically uh, give an exhaustive uh, account of all the different combinations and the things that can go wrong. Um, that's the problem. And, but yeah, it depends on how much time I have during the week to prepare all that. So. Okay. Thanks for coming again. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your week, of your week and come back next week. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs>